been this this uh, there's been this new trend that we're seeing where the, there's blurred lines between seed and series A's and the valuation for each are converging, check sizes are actually going up. And I'm getting the questions more and more from founders, especially at the seed stage, you know, should I raise more money if I'm offered it? And, and you know, but why do I need that? So I think we want to kind of, if you leave here today with a framework around how to think about, you know, do I raise more of a two to $3 million traditional seed? If I'm offered, you know, 6 million, should I just take it now? Um, we're going to kind of walk through a construct there. Not every piece is going to be relevant to your exact situation, but the idea is you have everything you need at your disposal and your arsenal to think about it. And, and that's kind of the point of today's conversation. Um, so I'll start with a little bit about myself. I'm, I've been an index for about a year and a half. I focus on our pretty much everything FinTech in the U S and a little bit of B2B SaaS as well. Um, I was at Stripe for about Four and a half, four years or so before this. Um, so hence the fintech angle. Worked across a bunch of different teams, kind of sales ops, enterprise sales, and a little bit of customer support ops, risk infrastructure, and then strategic finance near the tail end. Um, before that, did you know, kind of four years across banking and, and private equity, and realized that kind of late stage private equity was very not for me. Hence jumping to, at the time, it was a kind of a hundred eighty person startup uh, called Stripe. Um, Saster itself is, uh, is actually pretty close to home for me. I'm on the board of a company called uh, Revenue Cat, and uh, Jason Lumpkin and Saster Fund actually led the seed uh, back in 2018. So hopefully the first of, of many sort of collaborations we have together. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Georgia then to, to talk a little bit about herself before we dive into this. Thanks, Mark. Hi, guys. I'm Georgia. Um, I work with Mark here on the index investment team focusing predominantly on SME SaaS, marketplaces, and consumer. Um, I'm normally based in London, so the other side of the pond, um, but spend quite a bit of time in New York. Um, and right now, I'm actually quarantining in, in Oxfordshire. Um, so maybe two minutes on my background before going on to talk about Index. So I started out at Deliveroo, uh, working in the commercial team there to launch the business across the UK. Uh, this started uh, with everything like cold calling, cold walk-ins to restaurants, recruiting riders from the side of the road, hanging up flyers sort of everywhere and anywhere I could. Um, and it developed into managing different markets, sales teams and marketing budgets, um, and really strategizing internal operations around sales and onboarding processes. There, I definitely fell in love with the raw energy and atmosphere of being in an early stage startup uh, where things change every day and every week feels like a milestone. Uh, so as a result, I vowed to myself that I'd, I wanted to be in that kind of growth phase all the time um, and transitioned into the venture side of things. Uh, first, for an angel network, focusing on, on pre-seed and seed. Uh, secondly, for North Zone, which is a European-based venture capital fund, focusing predominantly on Series A. Um, and finally, for Index, uh, which is a global fund and, and focuses on, on multi-stage. So some of you may have heard of Index before or, or spoken with us before, but thought it would be helpful to give a bit of context around sort of how we operate and also uh, uh, show you the sort of perspective that we're coming from. Um, so Index is a 25-year-old fund born out of Europe and have been lucky enough to work with and invest in category-defining businesses. We're relatively sector agnostic, however, there are a couple of key themes it's worth noting from our portfolio. So on the fintech side, which Mark focuses on, um, our portfolio include things like Agien, Revolut, Plaid, iZettel. Um, on the future of work side, everything from Dropbox and Slack to Figma and Notion. On the enterprise software side, things like Datadog, Elastic, Calibra. And on the consumer side, things like Candy Crush, Etsy, Glossier, and Discord. Our most recent fund is $2 billion and roughly split between venture and growth. The venture being 800 million and the growth being 1.2 billion. So this means from a check size perspective, we're very much multi-stage uh, and tend to see around 40% of our deals going to C stage businesses, 30% to series A, and the remaining 30% to series B onwards. So a couple of things worth noting about us that at least we like to think make us unique. Uh, we're one of the few funds that despite being multi-stage have the same investment team working across seed to growth stage businesses. So on a pragmatic level, this means one day we could be assessing a company purely based on a pitch deck and team references versus another day we're looking at a team of a hundred and five years of trading. Why is this important? Um, if you partner with us at seed, you're partnering with us for the long term and don't need to jump through any more hoops or impress a new set of eyes further down the line within, within our firm. We'll go more into this during the presentation about how this could be a factor worth considering when you're looking to partner with a multi-stage fund at Seed. The second thing that makes us unique is that we're one of the only funds that are dual headquartered across Europe and the US. 
And by that, I mean, it's the same team operating out of two locations and investing out of the same fund. Again, why does this matter? Firstly, it means we don't invest in direct competitors across geographies. So when we back you, we're backing you as a full team globally. And secondly, it's therefore in the respective team's interest to help around expansion across the pond. And in the past, we've been very proactive in supporting companies expand from Europe to the US, as well as from the US to Europe. And crucially, support like this doesn't just come from the investment team or the person who sits on your board, but also from our strategy team, which we're really proud to have grown quite a bit over the last few years as capital is ultimately becoming a commodity and we need to do more from the outset for our portfolio companies. So our strategy team is essentially made up of talent, PR and comms and network development. So on the talent side, helping you think about what roles to hire and when and who within our network could be relevant. On the PR and comms side, helping you to tell your story to the right people. And on the network element side, helping to sell your product into CTOs and CIOs of top FTSE 100 companies via our long-term close relationships with them. So I hope this gives you a little bit of a flavor around index. Feel free to ping us with any questions we haven't covered here. Uh, but if nothing comes up for now, I'll hand over to Mark to talk about our topic today. Great. Thanks, Georgia. Uh, so so let's, let's, let's get a lay of the land first here before we kind of dive into the frameworks themselves. So, you know, these, these two charts here, there's a lot to really unpack in just two bar charts, but, you know, some of the trends we're seeing, I, I think, uh, you know, the, the growth is pretty crazy on the, the seed, the seed increase. And we're going to call these mega seeds, avocado seeds, whatever you want to call, you know, your, your favorite term for a $5 million plus seed. But what's interesting is over the last five years, the percentage of seeds that are above $5 million have tripled. And I think from 2014 to 2018, the caters north of 40% um, in that same kind of, in the same vein. And if you cherry pick a bunch of even just the recent deals in the last maybe eight to nine months or so, I think you're seeing, you're seeing well above, you know, that, that five, six, $7 million mark. So, you know, recent, recent deal, $16 million raised from a company called Trove, Pulley raised $10 million from, from Stripe a few months ago, Tandem raised eight to $9 million a few YC batches ago. And, you know, Another company called Pipe raised six million, and then actually another sixty million dollars seed after that. Granted, a lot of that sixty was actually debt, but you kind of get my point here. It's the, the list goes on. So, you know, what, what does that actually mean for people? You know, I think one takeaway for me is it's just nomenclature isn't as important anymore. So don't get hung up on seed, seed plus, Series A. At the end of the day, it's just how much money do I need? What what's the check size? What's the dilution to me as a founder? And and you know what? Am I setting the watermark for my valuation too high, too low? Or what does it look like? And you know, I think one problem. We'll get into this in a couple of the sections later. But you know, if you're raising six, seven, eight million dollars in a seed, you're often staring at twenty five percent, if not even thirty percent dilution right off the bat. So that is something to be very cognizant of. Is don't just anchor on that check size. And you know, I think the, the the key takeaway here is just ask the why. If you had to really tear out what are my top priorities for the next six to 12 months before I, between now and an A, you know, what's actually important to me? And, you know, is there a tier two and three of things I'm planning to just spend on because I have the money? And if that's sort of your answer, then maybe that tells you you should probably taper back how much you're taking on. So that's that's sort of the lay of the land. And then I think we're going to get into a little bit about the what these frameworks look like. Um, so from a, from a high level, uh, George is going to take us through kind of framework number one, and we're going to call this shots on goal. And, you know, what this really means is, you know, every startup at the seed stage going from idea to product market fit to generating revenue, you're going to have some form of, of binary upstart risk. But for more complex businesses, think kind of B2B marketplaces, or, you know, I have a merchant network and a and a consumer network to curate, you know, maybe you want to raise a little bit more upfront because that binary risk is actually enhanced. Um, so that's one thing to think about is how many shots on goal you might need. Second framework is going to be what we're referring to is just think two rounds ahead. And I mean, think two rounds ahead just basically means, you know, a lot of founders might take more of a myopic view. Oh, okay, here's how much I'm going to raise just the seed. Uh, think about the A, think about the B. And what does your total aggregate dilution look like as a founder if things go the way you think they will in the, the subsequent two rounds? So that's, that's going to be kind of the second framework is don't just get caught up in, in current round. Third piece is going to be around, you know, who do you ask these questions to? You know, I mean, the, all this dilution math, how do you think about series A, series B? So think about you're in the trenches partner. And, and I think like who you partner with at the seed stage, whether it's a consortium of a 
seed only fund and a multi-stage fund that that's sort of in the trenches with you, just a seed only fund, you know, just a multi-stage fund. How do you how do you think about the partner and what's important to you there? George is going to walk through that framework. And then the fourth piece is just going to be around this, the proliferation of what I'll call the corporate VC world. So Corporate VCs are not a new thing. I mean, Google's had one for a very long time that ultimately branched out into its own fund. Salesforce has had one for quite some time. Stripe is obviously one of the newer players. So, I, you know, there's just, I get this question more and more often is how do I think about partnering with a corporate VC? When's the right time? Should I ever? And so we'll get into a little bit of the kind of pros, cons frameworks to think about that piece. And um, yeah, that's our four frameworks. I'm going to hand it over to Georgia to talk about the shots on goal piece. Thanks, Mark. <clears throat> I think let's go. Oh, yeah, perfect. Perfect. Yeah. So this is the this is the shots on goal section. Um, so so happy to kick off here. No pun no pun intended. Um, what's interesting talking to seed stage companies is that very often founders don't tend to have a strong view on how much they want to raise. Um, the story probably goes that they've just kind of changed their LinkedIn status and came out of stealth mode. They've just launched on Product Hunt and articles just come out about them. They're flooded with investor inbound. And they're sort of seeing how conversations progress before coming up for air with a view on how much they want to raise. Of course, funding is ultimately a marketplace. You should actually see how the supply and demand dynamics work out over time. However, a useful exercise and one we recommend is to really calibrate and think through where a sum of money gets you and how this aligns with what you're trying to prove out in the early stage. So for instance, are these proof points around team? Do you need to prove that you can recruit credible exec hires with an industry or fun functional expertise that go beyond the co-founders? If so, how will you find them? Where will you find them? How will you incentivize them? And what's the timeline for getting them to join? Versus, are there proof points around product you need? In the, ide in the ideal scenario, what you need to build out an MVP? How many engineers? How many months runway of kind of heads down product mode do you require in order to get, get you there? Maybe you already have an MVP, but you want to prove out product market fit. If so, is there a user target or a mao wow dao ratio that you're, that you're looking for? Do you have a couple of lighthouse clients you're wanting to land in a given time frame? What's interesting here and, and important to note, because again, it, it comes up quite a bit, is really take the time to think about what types of customers you're going for uh, on the sort of SME to enterprise spectrum. And therefore, what kind of sales cycles you, you can expect to have, as this will really feed into runway assumptions. And, and we've seen a number of people perhaps getting caught short of this before. And finally, is building first mover advantage important to you at this stage? And how long do you need to prove that you're sort of out ahead for? This can vary with the types of business model. For example, a marketplace with multiple constituent types often needs more capital and more time to build up a moat. So when you're benchmarking yourself relative to other early stage seed rounds, make sure you're looking at comparable business models and products. Of course, only, know, only you know what makes best sense for your business, but we've seen scenarios where it's helpful to gather data points and perspectives during the fundraising process. Interestingly, some founders tend to be hesitant to talk to a fund that can also do later stage rounds with the idea that we'll, we'll talk to you when we get there. We're obviously biased, but it's it's worth noting that it could be super helpful to talk to later stage or multi-stage funds who have insight across the fundraising spectrum when you're thinking about these milestones. For instance, from our side, we often care less around revenue milestones in an early stage, but more focus on leading indicators around product, be that in retention, engagement, and upsell. I'm sure other funds calibrate this differently. So worth really understanding how your goals align with others during the process. All in all, ultimately, all this leads up to is a more informed opinion when you receive your term sheets. It ensures you have a really strong idea of what 2 million gets you versus what 3 million gets you versus what 10 million gets you. And enables you to calibrate the positive side of the coin, aka capital and opportunity, versus the negative side of the coin, aka dilution, which Mark will go on to talk about now. Over to you, Mark. Hey, thanks, Georgia. Uh, so as, as Georgia alluded to, there's, you know, thinking two rounds ahead, uh, you know, easier said than done, obviously, right? So, you know, you can predicting the future is nice, you know, you're not going to get it exactly right, but it helps to think about. So I'm going to sort of do this tale of two cities thing, paint a paint a avocado mega seed situation and a and a traditional seed situation, real companies and sort of how they played out between the seed and the bee. And we'll give you sort of the pros and cons of, of what ended up happening. And it's almost like we're doing a retrospective on both of these. So Situation A, and don't get too caught up in the, yeah, I'm going to rattle off 
you know, six sets of numbers here, just kind of think about the starting point and that's the most important takeaway here. But let's say situation A is this, this avocado seed. So we'll say 5 million on 20 million posts and we're gonna say 25% dilution upfront. And series A ends up being 15 million on a fairly high $75 million post, another 20% dilution. So we're saying that's around 45% cumulatively. And then, you know, your series B is now 25 million, $150 million post. And that's another, let's just say, let's call it for the sake of math, 20%, it's a little bit less. And, you know, you're looking at 63, 65% aggregate dilution at that point. So that'll kind of, we'll, we'll get into that in a second on the pros con side. So in this situation, the reason the, the founder took more money up front was that there was this dynamic of, you know, this B2B marketplace thing where you had to, you had to sign up merchants, you had to sign up, uh, you know, consumers. There's a lot of upstart risk. Uh, you potentially even had to discount certain users to kind of get your first 10 to 20 that were influential and build a little bit of a moat there. So it made sense. Um, I think if this all worked out as planned, you know, a pro of this scenario of raising this, this larger seed is that you could go straight to the B and, you know, you could be under 50% dilution at that point. If you're raising a, you know, you call it a series A, but in reality, you're raising like a 15 to $20 million, you know, maybe 80 to a hundred million dollar post, kind of like small series B. Obviously that didn't happen. So you kind of get into one of the cons here, which is, you know, now that you're taking more of a traditional path, luck stepping from this large seed, you're now staring at greater than 60% dilution across the, the founder set, you know, at, at two rounds later. So one thing to be very cognizant of. The, the next piece is, is going to be around, uh, let's, let's hop back to the pros. So obviously with more money earlier, you have more room for multiple pivots. And this gets into the, I have to try a bunch of different things. My initial kind of product idea, product A might never even work and product B and C are where you need to go. And you have time to prove out kind of whether it's financial metrics or usage metrics, whatever ends up being most important for you between the C and the A, you have time to do all that. And, you know, there's this kind of adage around, you know, a lot of the successful, successful companies we've seen, you know, take Slack, for example, it was a video game company in the early days. And, you know, you see this kind of flat initial growth curve before that initial, you know, before the next kind of inflection points hit. But when a company is successful five, 10 years later, people forget that. So that's definitely something to keep in mind. Um, rounding out the, the cons piece, there's, you know, we touched on kind of the aggregate dilution, but let's also talk about check size risk and, and, sort of setting a high watermark or an artificially high watermark at the A and the B. So if you're raising a five, six, $7 million seed and you, to keep dilution even around 25%, you're often going to be looking at maybe 25 to even 30 million post money at times. And, you know, it works for people, but there is risk that you're setting a really high watermark now that your A has to be at least maybe 60 pre, you know, if you want to show positive signal, then other piece is check size. So this is going to be a bit illogical, but it's worth saying because I have a lot of, I have a lot of, especially kind of technical friends um, that, that sort of run this process when they're thinking about joining a, a kind of early growth stage company. They'll, they'll go open up Crunchbase and say, you know, okay, they, X company raised 7 million at seed, 15 million at A and, and 20 million at B. You know, oh, why did it only why did they only raise 20 million to be from a check size perspective? In reality, it has nothing to do with whether or not the company is doing well or not. But to show kind of flat or a diminished check size could actually have implications on hiring. So it's worth thinking, despite the fact that from a financial standpoint, it doesn't actually make a ton of sense. Um, so that's kind of scenario A there. Scenario B, let's talk about this more traditional two to three million dollar seed path. So in this case, company with two technical co-founders, uh, one was very business minded as well. Um, they raised, let's say, two million on uh, it was thirteen million posts, so something like fifteen percent dilution. Um, Series A, ten million on fifty posts, twenty percent dilution, and then twenty million on I think it was close to about a hundred million posts for the Series B. So in this case, you're actually looking at closer to 45 50 percent dilution, and that seems more reasonable for people at this point. And Honestly, we'll get into this near the end of the presentation, but I think a lot of folks, this works for them. A ton of runway, you have time to test out product market fit. You know, you don't really need to throw a ton of money at hiring right off the bat until you feel like you're in a place where go to market makes sense. Um, and, and that's often a pro of this. Is you don't feel the need to deploy unnecessary capital just because you have it. Um, and, and kind of, you're not setting that, you can have this more traditional path from seed A to B, where you're not setting too high of a watermark. And of course, the, the major con here is pretty straightforward. You know, if you're raising only 2 million bucks and you kind of use that runway after a couple of different pivots that don't work out, then you're maybe looking at kind of an insider bridge round, which is obviously not what you want going into this. So 
that's just, that's something to think about, you know, happy to, you know, I know I just threw a lot of numbers at you here, but this is kind of the framework to think through each of these rounds and happy to kind of address this more in the Q and A after, but on this topic, um, you know, this whole dilution math, how much do I raise now can be, can be intimidating for a founder. So this is actually a good transition into what George is going to talk about, which is, you know, who's your partner in the trenches to answer these types of questions, because at the end of the day, you want to build a business. So I'm going to hand this to Georgia to talk more about how to think about a partner in the trenches. Thanks, Mark. Um, maybe it's worth taking a bit of a step back here and, and kind of, I wanted to start off by saying that in some way there's, there's never been a better time to be a founder from a fundraising perspective. Um, the fundraising environment is highly competitive uh, with more and more funds emerging. Um, and as a result, round construct and forming syndicates amongst investors is becoming increasingly common. So it's really worth taking the time to think about what different combinations could look like at this stage. And again, having an opinion on what your ideal scenario could be. Now we couldn't do a presentation about seed rounds uh, as a multi-stage fund and not talk about signaling risk. Um, this is a conversation topic that has come up before and will likely come up again. Um, and interestingly, although the lines are no doubt blurring between what constitutes a pre-seed versus a seed versus a series A fundraise, Interestingly, the nomenclature around types of funds, aka whether you're a seed fund or not, seem to be, seem to be far more sticky. Now, of course, there's, there's a totally valid argument sort of against uh, or avoiding signaling risk. And by that, I mean taking a multi-stage fund's money at seed and risking them not following on in the A, thereby putting off other investors as a result. Optics are no doubt important in a fund race, so this shouldn't be, this shouldn't be dismissed. That said, Arguably, if your future investor is put off based on what others are doing or how others are thinking, this arguably demonstrates a certain level of conviction they have in, in you and your, your company. Meanwhile, on the flip side, ironically, the underlying notion around signaling risk is that people really notice when a multi-stage fund backs an early stage company. This isn't just prospective investors for the next round, but it's also prospective talent, journalists, and clients. In fact, as the co-founder of Loom said recently on a 20 minute VC podcast, and for context, he took General Catalyst, and, which is a multi-stage fund and, and Point Nine Capital, which is a seed fund at seed. He said, do not underestimate the halo effect of a multi-stage fund um, and ultimately how it can add value to the perception of your business and the optics around your business. So for instance, kind of going back to this whole shots on coal discussion, if the key milestone is hiring a multi-stage fund with perhaps a larger talent network that kind of spreads across its portfolio could be useful here. If a key milestone is customers sort of building trust with prospective clients and having a brand rubber stamp of approval could also be helpful. In terms of kind of getting smart people around the table, be that on angels or operators or advisors, I know a number of both multi-stage funds and seed funds spend a lot of time and effort curating and engaging sort of high caliber angel investment communities. Uh, for deal flow, for advisory, and for network purposes. So having a roster of smart co-investors behind you and really leveraging the existing networks that, that, that funds have could be, uh, could be really helpful. Um, this is definitely not to say that, that multi-stage funds alone are, are the best option either. Anecdotally, we've, we've partnered up with a number of seed funds at the seed stage, uh, for instance, for companies such as Robinhood, Deliveroo, and, and Figma, to name a few. And, and seed funds have been and are fantastic partners who offer complementary and, and different support roles, roles over time relative to a multi-stage fund strategy and perspective. So we love to partner with them and work together to kind of get you to the, to the next stage. Another co-investment partner that we're seeing kind of come up more frequently now, um, particularly within the fintech sector, is uh, corporate VCs. So over to Mark, who's had a number of experiences with them. Great. Thanks, Georgia. And, you know, as, as kind of alluded to earlier, there's you know, corporate VC is not a novel thing, but it, they are becoming more relevant, I think, in the VC space, whether it's the number of players or just more capital to deploy from interesting companies. And, you know, there are obvious pros and cons to this. So maybe I'll start there. So major pros, I mean, it's hard to argue with some of these things. You get a, a complimentary kind of mentor, advisor, partner that you're still kind of living the day to day as an operator. And, I, you know, obviously on the VC side, many of us do come from the operating world, but it's not the same as necessarily having someone that is still kind of build, living, breathing, building products. So you can't really discount that. And there's, you know, a second piece of go to market, you know, a lot of these corporate VCs usually invest in companies that have somewhat of a synergistic relationship to them. And there's great sort of channel partnership opportunities, potentially that corporate VC is actually a, a customer in and of themselves. So 
obvious pros. I think there is definitely a question around timing and when it's appropriate that I think is worth highlighting. So for a seed stage company, sometimes it can be tough on the corporate VC side because you the the term sheets can be a little bit more restrictive depending on who you work with. That's one thing to be cognizant of is just, you know, what does this look like compared to an institutional VC's term sheet? Can I work with all the suppliers, vendors that I would have wanted to in a current state? Or is this is this uh, limiting me in a way that might be, you know, not beneficial right now and could be fine at the A or B. Um, and, you know, we have great examples of how this progression worked. You know, the Fast is a company that we did to see in Stripe led a, a large Series A in the company. And, you know, it was the right time for, for someone like a Stripe to do that. And I think on the, the kind of other question side of the world is, you know, are you setting yourself up for more of an aqua hire and is that what you want? Or, or is there a world where you want to be a standalone business in the future and, and keep it that way? So these are all kind of things to waffle on when you're navigating the, the, the corporate VC environment. But at the end of the day, they've proven to be great partners. Um, we're in another company called Pilot with Stripe, actually, where we co-led the Series B. So, you know, lots of great opportunities, lots of great corporate VC funds out there. But just think about timing and especially the seed stage. I think the biggest risk is, you know, you're signing up for product A. If if you have to go product B or C and that, you know, and, and the term sheet you sign is kind of restrictive and doesn't allow you to do what B or C might look like, just think about that and maybe wait till you get the product market fit before it's the right partnership. So all sort of scenarios to kind of walk through in your own mind. Um, so that's that's kind of on the corporate VC side. I think, you know, before we before we ultimately conclude and get to the Q and A, we've we've obviously given a lot of frameworks here, right? And you know, we talked about small seed versus large seed. And, you know, maybe let's, I'll take kind of a stance on this. I do think there is a time and place for a five, six, seven, eight million dollar seed, but whether that should be the exception rather than the norm. And in a lot of cases, two, three, maybe $4 million are probably the right move because you get a lot of runway. If you have a, if you have a pretty well-rounded founding team and you don't need to hire another three, four people right off the bat that have, you know, co-founder economics, you know, definitely play devil's advocate and think through why you really need to give up 25 to 30% of your company for, you know, $7 million, unless you, unless you have a good case for it. Maybe you have a, a longer enterprise sales cycle you need to build for, uh, you need some bat, you need some money sitting on your balance sheet, depending on like, you know, if you're, if you're kind of working with a third party lender. So there are, there are reasons. Um, but just make sure those reasons are real, tangible, and necessary to to hit your first kind of six to twelve month goals. Um, I'll let Georgia uh, kind of give an opinion on this too, and then we'll get into the Q and A part. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, I think maybe a point I'll end on here. Um, despite having kind of spent the last twenty five minutes talking about different frameworks and pros and cons and different perspectives uh, for kind of what's what's right for your business right now. Something to never lose sight of, and, and by the way, we, we tell ourselves the same thing, um, is ultimately we're investing in people and you're finding a long-term partner. Uh, so when, when you're flipping through those multiple $10 million term sheets for your business, uh, you know, don't lose sight of kind of who's behind them and who has the conviction and the rapport with you and the strategic thinking that you want on your team and, and in the trenches beside you. Um, and I think that that's it from our side. Um, thanks a lot for listening, guys, uh, and happy to field field questions for the next the next uh, 10, 20 minutes. Okay, Q and A. Sorry, we're now just absorbing the the questions. Um, um, do you have similar data and examples for rounds raised in the EU in Euro? Yes, we do. So as uh, as we said, we're dual headquartered in, in London and San Francisco. So um, collect uh, sort of data on, on both. Um, I think with, with everything, you know, the US, I would say kind of ecosystem is, is, is probably a number of years ahead of the European ecosystem. We're catching up, we're gonna do it, but um, it's, a, it's a little bit behind. So when we're thinking about round sizes, you know, maybe if we're talking about a six million seed in, in, in you know, new seed in, in the US, uh, perhaps that's like a three to five million seed in, in, in the EU. Um, so uh, one that comes to mind is, is Hopin, which did a five million uh, seed before raising, uh, I think it was like either 15 or 20 million series A, uh, that was in a vir virtual events business, but I'm um, happy to share the data uh, with, with you afterwards if that's helpful uh, and helps kind of calibrate where you're at.
Great. Um, so let me take this one about sort of valuation being a function of, of amount raise. So it's a good question. And, and I think if I'm kind of distilling down the example here, you know, maybe a, a, another way to frame this question is, do, do investors have, have sort of a line in the sand on percentage ownership? And is it up to the founders to try to work around that as that being kind of the, the anchor point? Um, in cases, yes. So I think the, the answer to this is definitively yes. There are times when an investor says, this is a great idea. There's a lot of risk to it. So I'd, I'd prefer to own 20% of this up front. Um, granted, every investor is going to have sort of their, their different thresholds for different risk profiles. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, as, you as a founder can kind of work through what you just remember, it's your company. And if the investor is truly interested, they, there will be wiggle, wiggle room in some of these situations where you say, I, I love this, you know, seed fund only as a partner to you, multi-stage fund, are you willing to take 15% so they can have, you know, five to 8%. And there, there are scenarios that that happens all the time. So, you know, you can work through collectively to a conclusion when, when the investor is interested, you know, there's always going to be a starting point and, and an anchor and oftentimes it is ownership there. So that's, you know, hopefully that answers the question, but it's, uh, it's, it's a good one. The answer is yes, but there's wiggle room. Yeah, I'll, I'll take uh, one from Aman. How do you, oh, it's just, oh, it's gone. How do you value a company in a, in a seed round? Um, it's a really good question. There's so many variables here. So firstly, like looking at the sector and the kind of market size they're attacking, because from our side, we kind of work backwards and we think about valuation and look at sort of uh, the sort of total opportunity and what that looks like from return. So that's the kind of top down um, sort of market analysis we do. Then there's a bottoms up around kind of where you're at in a business to our point around shots on goal. You know, are you uh, sort of have a great idea and a passionate uh, and a PowerPoint or do you have a MVP that's that got a number of kind of live customers and are looking to scale up? Um, as well as obviously the team, you know, do you have relevant experience in the space? Um, you know, have you built a business before? Um, and of course, like I said, you know, it's, it is definitely a, a supply and demand. You know, if you've got got term sheets for this amount um and 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 we're talking to you, you know to go to go drastically lower w w would probably would probably not be smart so yeah a number of variables both top down bottom up and then obviously depending on on the on the fundraise dynamics let's see i'm happy to take i'm just going to try to tick from the top here so let's see this next one is <laughs> Um, you know, yeah. Should you rate like when's the appropriate time to raise this Series A? Question from Chuka uh, after raising kind of this traditional two three million dollar seed. The, you know, Georgia kind of touched on this in I think her her first framework. You know, the, the shots on goal piece. So every company is 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 made differently. Um, you know, but often more often than not, like there's the obviously easy answer. It's like, do I want to hit you know X amount of MRAR? But oftentimes I think that's an overused answer. And, you know, it could just be, what does usage look like? You know, like what's my daily active to, to monthly active user ratio, I think is one that's actually pretty interesting for a lot of different business sites, especially on the kind of B2B SaaS side, there's an analytics tool component to it. Um, you know, it's like, I if I have over half my users uh, that are monthly active using this daily, that's a pretty good indicator. And I don't even care if you're making money yet on it. Eventually someone's going to pay for that if it's that sticky. So there are, you know, think through like, what are your key product KPIs? Um, and, and if you want to get more into the logistical timing of it, you know, make sure I, I always tell the founders I work with, think about you maybe at least two quarters of runway ahead. So if you think, OK, I definitively need to raise my Series A by, you know, um, let's just say end of Q4 2020 and we're as of today, um, I'd say start you know, thinking about your fundraising pitch now, because more often not founders, I think, underestimate how long it takes to gear up that narrative and make sure those those discussions happen. I mean, yes, there are scenarios where rounds are getting done in 48 hours, but that's still the exception, not the norm. So make sure you plan in advance for these types of things. Um, great. I'll answer a quick one from from Sean. Do you prefer a cold email, LinkedIn outreach or other? I think probably a cold email because it's easier to keep track of than 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 LinkedIn. I don't know about you, Mark. The sorry, the cold email piece. I mean, I I always look at cold emails. Actually, like I try to make a point of it, especially when they're written. Um, you know, I, I actually love when people sort of like customize it in some way, shape, or form, and I will always respond to that if it is because if I saw the person took an extra five ten minutes to to say something meaningful, then I think it's I will always give them the time of day. Um, to the question on LinkedIn, I, I actually rarely answer LinkedIn messages, mainly just because there's a lot of noise and it's just too hard to navigate. And 
it's a trade off in time of day, but I try to prioritize this stuff in the inbox. Cool. Um, will you invest in other geos? LATAM? Yes, we have a we have an unannounced investment in LATAM that I think Mark's uh, works quite closely with. Um, so yeah, predominantly predominantly uh, in the US and Europe, but can definitely go go beyond that. A couple of uh, companies in Australia as well. So let's see the tech. This is actually an interesting question here. This technical. Uh, so gone Kahlo, the technical founder, you know, how do you think about spending on a sales team? This is actually probably one of the most common things I work with. Cause I think almost all of the founder, 75% of the founders I work with right now are all technical teams. So the sales team question actually comes up a lot. So uh, I was actually on the phone two days ago dealing with this. And I think the rules of thumbs interesting. I mean, and I harken back to the, the Stripe time at, you know, it, is there a self-serve component demand gen piece to your business or is this purely an enterprise sales cycle is, is kind of an easy, but first question you should ask yourself. And, you know, if you're creating, and then, and then you want to break that down into, do I need outbound sales sooner rather than later, just inbound sales? Do I need SDRs? No SDRs kind of on the junior side, or actually should I funnel more, more into organic marketing and have more people funnel into me? So I think you, you want to break down your, your, your kind of like, what do you need from the sales side? And then, you know, maybe do you need a senior hire right off the bat? I think it's an interesting question. If you're more of this like self-serve demand gen inbound sales muscle type business, you don't always need a kind of like CRO, you know, year two or three. Um, if you're going to start selling more to, you know, mid-market enterprise early, definitely try to pay up for a good executive hire. So I think that's, that's kind of a good framework to have on that. Um, but it's definitely not one size fits all, but those are good sort of things to think about. Yeah. And I'll take Hinal's question around, could you talk about the risk attitude in the U S versus Europe? Um, he says in the U S equity is shared more widely across the team. Therefore our founders more protective around dilution with investors than in Europe, or do they founders get diluted more so that the other employees get equity? So this is something that, that we've spent quite a bit of time, particularly on the, on the European side, because you're right, the kind of concept of founders giving equity to the entire team is definitely more developed uh, in the US and in Europe. However, uh, we've been kind of waging a campaign against this uh, across, uh, I think, multiple years, uh, headed up by, by Wojtek, who, who kind of heads our comms in, in Europe, um, called Not Optional. Uh, check it out. It's got a whole, whole website and, and hashtag. Um, trying to encourage uh, more European founders to make sure that they're kind of fairly recognizing early stage employees and not just early stage, you know, all employees and, uh, and making sure they're incentivized to really build the business. So I think, uh, you know, it's definitely changing. And to my point, I think we're, we're somewhat, you know, almost like the teenager to the, to the US adult in some ways. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it, we're, we're definitely seeing it more and more now, uh, founders want, wanting to make sure that uh, they're sort of adequately rewarding their 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 employees and, and actually sort of constantly calibrating it. In fact, this afternoon, you know, I was on a on a on a board that we discussed exactly this and making sure that existing employees were given were given more. Uh, and, and you know, we were obviously happy to take that dilution because if they're fantastic people, that's that's the most important thing. Great. I'll take this next one. Um, you know, changing pitch when approaching a corporate VC versus regular VC? I think the short answer is actually you don't need to change a ton necessarily, but if you want, you know, maybe if you want to highlight one piece that you'd you know, add a slide or a, you know, an extra piece in your memo, however you're approaching it to, you know, why is this a synergistic relationship between you and the corporate fund? Um, you know, are they giving you distribution and you're actually adding a, a very important feature to a product set that they just don't have the time or resources to build? I think that that hits home a lot. Um, you know, in a future state, here's where, you know, I mean, it depends on how you want to position it for, you know, acquisition or not acquisition, how close you want to be on that front. But I mean, that that's an interesting discussion point that I've seen some people have. Um, but I think at the end of the day, it's just sort of why do you plug a gap in their current product suite? And will they be able to sell more by distributing you through their own channels? That tends to be where it really boils down to. And I think that's a good sort of extra data point to add in when you're pitching them. Yeah, I'll take Brett's question. How do you think about investment opportunities with a strong business, but the founders are more diluted than normal? Um, 
Yeah, I'd actually be curious to get your thoughts on this, Mark. We, we've seen it. Um, it's definitely, you know, relative to kind of the story of the business, whether it spun out of somewhere, whether there was a kind of backstory and to Mark's point, whether, you know, there was a bit of plateauing and figuring out product market fit and then things spiking and in which case the sort of uh, people sort of running the ship now weren't necessarily running the ship then. Um, we try our best to kind of actually sort of fix that in, in our in our round and make sure that the person who who's kind of you know responsible or the CEO or the or the co-founder who's who's kind of heading it up is you know that has got a significant stake in the business otherwise um you know where, where's the incentive uh, for them um so it's not a you know it's not definitely a um uh what's it called a, you know a deal killer or, or anything like that and, and we do see it and particularly if there's a kind of reasonable story behind it it's something that, that we try and help with uh during during the fundraise i don't know whether that's that's what you'd say mark yeah i think the only no i think absolutely right and and the only thing i'll add to that is long before you know when i'm looking at investment before i look at the cap table it's more of just a you know i guess what was once a really like an in-person sit down at this point is more so via zoom but it's just the, the let me have the candid personal conversation of what drives this human inherently and are they in this for the long run and I, you know, you have to open the cap table and they own 5% of the business or something like that. Then maybe you have to open up a discussion around that. But usually you can tell if is the passion there, are they in this for the long run and why? And those are the reasons that matter more so than, you know, pulling threads at five to 10% ownership on the cap table. Um, there's a cup, there's quite a few questions around kind of how to send stuff. I think if our email's not, I can just put it in the chat. Uh, if our email's not in on the invite, let me just I actually don't know how to do that. Um, oh, here we go. Let's Ooh, see. Panels. Well, George is there doing goes. that. Let me, I can take this question from Brian on okay. over VCs hitching to your wagon, established player in the industry. So, yeah, I mean, this is, it, this is a very good question. And I think this is one of the kind of key anchor points that you need to ask yourself when you're, when you're deciding to, to potentially partner with one, um, you know, good examples are, you know, if I'm partnering with a corporate VC, you know, even when I was at Stripe, it's like, do you want to, you know, work with other PSPs? And, uh, and I'm more often not actually, they're fine with that. So you just have to ask the questions, like, am I cutting myself off from other vendors? Um, you know, if I'm working with a Google, can I work with an Apple in any case, if it's mobile related? So I, I think what's more important is just asking, you know, legally and just sort of like, you know, getting the verbal answer to like, can, who can I work with and who are you restricted from working with is, is very important in these scenarios. And that's probably one of the key two or three questions that, that I definitely wanted to highlight when you're, when you're thinking about these rounds. And I will take, so question is, if you have an early founder that has decided to step back, but is still holding onto the equity, how do future seed investors perceive that? Would investors see that as debt equity? Would they be required to divest the new investor pool? So I think this is actually similar to the the, the last question. I think you know obviously th things happen um, within businesses and, and and dynamics kind of work themselves out. I think a question would have at a seed stage uh, is that already if there's like an early founder that's left, kind of you know what was the what was the kind of reasoning behind that and like what happened there to again really understand like Mark was saying sort of how how the current founders or, or remaining founders think. Um, but it, it's definitely, again, not not a kind of huge red flag. It's more just trying to understand what happened um, and and kind of how how the remaining founders would, would put in sort of systems to make sure that they don't have sort of key members of the team leaving again. Um, so yeah, it's very much down to the individual. It's, it's not a kind of strike through, um, but we'd, we'd definitely want to understand why. So let's see, I'm, I'm happy to take this question around uh, from Eric. I think it's basically saying, yeah, there's it, there's this kind of counterintuitive uh, uh, thought process here around higher risk in the business, but should you get more money? And of course, like as a founder, you know, will you be able to get more money if you have a higher risk business? So I think the one point worth clarifying on this one is that, yeah, not every business that is, it's not necessarily a, a function of of only risk because in, in theory, that's just purely counterintuitive. But when the you know, in VC, we're in a very sort of like binary upside industry. And and like, if there is a 
it's more so is there a massive ceiling in this thesis and does it make sense? Like, can you buy that even in the 10 to 20% chance this may work out? Like you, you kind of see that vision, you dream the dream with the founder. And even though there's the risk, you're still willing to take it because that upside is huge. So it's sort of a, it's a coupling the ceiling with how risky it is equals maybe you should do more money to increase the likelihood that this works from, you know, this is purely made up, but 10% to 30%, you know, so that's, that's the thought process there. Uh, so you, you need to have the, the upside coupled with the risk. It can't just be a function of only risk. Yeah. And I'll take, say you raised, Oh, it's gone. Oh no, say you raised $1 million seed and now you'd like to raise three to 5 million. Now, should that be a pre a instead of a, um, we're based in Sierra and in B2B SaaS, mainly midstream. Okay. So I think there, again, hard to kind of say whether it should be a pre-A or A without, without knowing more. Um, we definitely see 1 million rounds being passed as pre-seed rounds. Um, so if someone said I'm raising a three to 5 million seed round, you know, that would be fine. But again, we have portfolio companies that have, again, positioned it as a sort of pre-A or, or bigger seed. I think actually the point and maybe, you know, what we're trying to get across is I think it's, it's actually less like the sort of the, the nomenclature around what's a seed or what's an A is, is definitely kind of dissolving out. Um, and it's more around understanding actually what amount of money works for you. So if I were you kind of go, go to your, go to the investors that you're talking to um, and, and sort of see how they think about you in the, in that spectrum. Um, and then not, don't worry too much whether people People call it a pre-A or an A. Um, and in fact, you can kind of fluctuate between those two names regardless of, depending on sort of who you're talking to or how you want to position. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's almost can be used and leveraged uh, rather than something that you have to like categorically stick by. Let's see. So it looks like we have time for, for one more question here. I'll actually, this is a, a maybe a more tactical one, but I think it's actually, it's a, it's a pretty good question around ESOP and how much you should you make that. So this, this one's basically saying, you know, um, you know, LATAM investors think eight to 10%, you know, but if we're trying to expand to the US market, do we need more? I think we need more. And, you know, it's interesting, 10% seems to be kind of the the industry anchor point, but by no means should that be, you know, there, there's room to change. I mean, I, we just, I just did a seed two, one of these seed investments we made earlier this year was 15%. Um, and, and the reason was for which the, in this case, actually was one of the ones that I alluded to that was not a technical co-founding team. They needed to hire a really good designer and a really good uh, sort of like technical co-founder that you know, needed co-founder-esque economics. In that case, it makes total sense to, to maybe take 15%. And I think the, the second question you should ask in this case is, you know, whose pocket's that coming out of? I mean, you can structure it 15%. Is that, you know, out of the founder's dilution or can that be from more, you know, is there wiggle room on the investor side? So you can kind of work out a way where you know, bump it up from 10 to 15 and just, just figure out if you can split that evenly. Um, but very common to do that in, in certain cases, 10% is usually just the starting point. Great. Well, Great. thank you, Mark and Georgia. And thank you all for watching. Um, if you have any further questions for Index Ventures, make sure um, to check out the email in the chat. We put both their emails in there. As a reminder, this video will be available on demand at the close of the event. Um, and now please make your way to the next session and enjoy the rest of your time at Saster Annual. Thanks everyone. Thanks guys.